Get ready to find the keys to living the life you always wanted to live. Reverend Steve James will share powerful keys to living the life that Jesus Christ came to make available. All right, well, dear Heavenly Father, we're just so blessed and thankful to be your sons and daughters, God. God, I thank you that we can learn a lot in this uh, short teaching series on the liberty and freedom we have in Christ Jesus. We can learn a little bit about how to stand in this world today with all that's going on in it, God, that we can get our counsel and our understanding from your word so that we can stand against the wiles and the methods of the adversary so that we can live the more abundant life that Jesus Christ came to make available, God. I thank you that we are in control of our minds and what we think and what we do, God, and you can show us from your word you know, how to do that, how we can keep our mind on you, God, and the things that you have available for us, God. So, God, I thank you for just watching over us and loving us in a daily basis, God. And I thank you for the word as we learn and grow, God, that you can just help us tremendously. So, God, I thank you for these things, and I thank you in the name of your wonderful son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Uh, if you have the syllabus on the first page is where I'm going to start. And we're going to get into the liberty and freedom in Christ Jesus. Now, today is the 4th of July. It's when here in the United States that we celebrate uh, our independence, our independence from Great Britain. We wanted to be able to govern ourselves as a country. And when I was younger, I learned a lot about the history of our country. And one of the things that I could see is it was a miraculous outcome. We lost most of the battles. God had to intervene so many times in like George Washington's life, how Benedict Arnold got caught. You know, God just guided this country so much that we got these freedoms because the majority of the people at that time wanted to be able to worship God the way they wanted to, according to what they saw in, in God's word and believed it. And that's how this country came about. But the real freedom and victory was actually started a couple thousand years ago or so before that with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He came so that we could really have freedom. We could really have freedom in all its gusto and all its peace and all its glory. It was really available. And if you can start off in your syllabus here, it says in John, and one of the reasons for the syllabus is so that we can go through quite a few, you know, scripture without having to go find them. And they're all written right here. And I would recommend that you check these things out on your own later after the, the teaching series, but in John 8, 31, 32, and 36, it says, And Jesus said unto those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, and there's a condition there, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And free indeed means to make you truly free. See, a government can't really truly make you free. You're free because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us and what we believe and what we hold in our minds. That is it, which we will see in this teaching series. And you know what else Jesus Christ did? He came and rescued us. He rescued us. 
And in order to understand that God rescued us, we need to know how we got into a position of needing to be rescued. And we're going to look at that teaching series that we're doing. The root of mankind's problem stems back to Genesis 1.28, when God originally gave man rulership, dominion, and authority over the world. Man was placed in this world as a ruler and caretaker, but when he sinned sinned due to the disobedience of God, he lost it, and he handed the rulership to the devil in the fall. That is high treason. It is dynamic, the results of that. He gave... God gave Adam dominion over this world, and Adam gave it to God's arch enemy, the devil. And the devil offered it to Jesus Christ in the temptations as recorded in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, And the devil taketh him up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I don't know how he did it, but all the kingdoms. So that must have been all the kingdoms that were happening then and all that continue to happen. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. And that's what he did. The adversary offered Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't take him up on that. Jesus Christ says, not me. See, the devil's number one goal is to be worshipped instead of God. It really is. He wants to be what his first plan, his plan is to be worshipped like God. Now, that's hard to do, because who wants to worship devil? Who wants to be known as the devil worshiper? There are some, but not many. So he uses little trickery. But look at uh, Luke 4, 7. This is how Jesus Christ handled that. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. That's what he offered him. If thou wilt worship me, the devil offered that to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, no, it is written. In the New American Standard, I'd like to look at uh, Colossians 1.13, where it says, For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. See, Adam put us in this position. The adversary now has control of all the kingdoms of the world. But God rescued us from the dominion of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of or by the accomplished works of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. So I want to look a little bit at that as a background. In the beginning, in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And God created in the beginning the heaven and the earth. In the, well, in the first word in this Bible up here, if you can see it, the Holy Bible by George Lamza, the first word in that Bible is God. In the original text, the first thing that was written was God. God. Telling us God always comes first, even in the, as he had his word written. God. This is a great key to understand so that you don't get fooled as you by thoughts and ideas of the world, which the devil controls. As we go through this teaching series, one of the things I want you to note is how, many, how, how the world is used. We're going to see this, the world, uh, used a lot, that term, the world, and what it means. So we need to, I'd like you just to pay attention to that when it comes up. But in Genesis 1, 2, it says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The earth was, or an accurate translation would be, 
became without form and void, empty, became empty. And in Isaiah 45, 18, it tells us, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he established it, he created it, not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. See, that was God formed the earth to be inhabited. Something happened. He didn't create it that way. Something happened. Something charis, I mean, just dynamic happened. And what happened was there was a war in heaven, and we're going to look at that. So, And I'm doing this so that we can just get a background of how this world got into the shape and place it's in. But in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the waters and in the water. Six says, Here, hereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And this is talking about the world that was, talking about the world that was there in Genesis 1.1. And Second Peter 3, 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, and now it's talking about the one that's now, the one that is now, by the same word are kept in store, preserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It says it's kept in store and preserved. In other words, God watches over this world over this earth, over our lives. And then we're preserved. We're preserved until the day of judgment. So we don't have to walk around worried about something's going to happen like a, anything. Some, some meteor is going to wipe us out, make, make a good movie. But we, we are preserved. We are like a baby in his mother's arms. God takes care of us. And we need to have that assurance in our lives when we are God's children. Pretty neat. The heavens and the earth, which are now, which I just read, <laughs> is talking about Genesis 1, 2, and following. And it's the one that we're living in now. In Second Peter 2, 12, it says, for looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth. Therein dwelleth righteousness. It's talking about the third heaven and third earth, which is still to come. And it's the only global one and woman that I'm even the least bit concerned of because I know we're preserved. I know God takes care of us. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more than abundant. We are in God's tender heart. And I like to look at 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 1 through 4. Talking about the third heaven and third earth, it says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul is saying, I'm going to tell you about some of my the visions and revelation I have of it. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. See, he's talking about the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. All he knows is he got the revelation. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. See, Paul saw the visions, the revelation about the third heaven and third earth, 
but he could not talk about it or tell about it. It was future for Paul and it's future for us also, which is similar to what you might be able to read in the book of Revelations, okay? Because John was allowed to write what he saw. What happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? That's what we're going to look at. I call it here in the syllabus, you know, the war in the heavens. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And he's still doing that. He's still doing that. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the star of God. I will. Look at all the I will. I will sit upon the mount of the, uh, of the congregation in the sides of the north. And the, the word I got here, the word north means at times pointing to God. Pointing to God. On the sides of God. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will five times it says that. I will be like the most high. And that's always his goal. His number one goal. The other goals that the adversary has is to defeat God's people. Because we stand for God. He wanted to be above the star God. Look at Ezekiel uh, 28, 15 through 19, and it says, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. See, Lucifer, one of the archangels, three archangels, he was created wonderfully until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitudes of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mount of God, and I will destroy thee, O covered cherubim, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He was so beautifully his heart was lifted up. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitudes of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. That's his destination. From the midst of him, fire, right? From the midst of thee, and he will be ashes upon the, the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee, among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shall thou be any more. There's going to be a point where he is done. He is done. And that's going to be pretty a good day. We're always looking for that better day. Well, that better day will be when he is destroyed. And that's the day that I'm looking for. Because of thy beauty and thy pride. That's why it happened to him. The multitude of thy iniquities. But we know his end. A fire in the midst of thee. Ashes upon the earth. That's what we know. Just want to take a, a couple minutes here. And just look at the pride. In 1 Timothy uh, 3, 6. It says, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride. Fall into the condemnation of the devil. See, that's how the adversary can work with your pride. 
you got a little pride, a little ego, and then you can say, hey, I can give you something here. And the next thing you know, just little steps get you into condemnation, into the wrong side. Look at Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. See, the adversary was our example, and I have seen this in people's lives just generally, where they, they, they're they so haughty about where they're going and what they're doing, you can almost guarantee that they're going to have a fall unless they change. Maybe we could help people that are in that position. Just, you know, maybe. Pride goes before a fall. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. You know, the humble in spirit, they live like God first, others second, I'm willing to be third. Pretty neat. Let's go, I mean, it's in our syllabus. Let's go, this is the New American Standard Version I got here, Romans 8, 17 through 22. Let's read it together. And if children, then heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That's who we are. If indeed we suffered with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And I learned this week that word worthy means to be in agreement. In agreement what God's word says. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not to be agreed upon or it should be agreed upon to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waited eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, but now we are the sons of God. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. The creation itself also will be set free from the slavery of corruption unto the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When we are made children of God, which we are when we get born again, we, we are part of the freedom of the glory as children of God. Jesus Christ is our brother, sometimes called big brother. But I like just to say, brother, the whole cre creation groans and suffers in pain together until now, until now that we are the sons of God. Pretty neat. Revelation, let's look at Revelation 12, 1 through 9. The Revelation is written about a future administration, and there's many things that are written in Revelation that I don't understand. I believe it's written to a future administration, but there are things in here that we can gleam out of this, okay? And there's some things that are written in this section that I will try to gleam a little knowledge out of it. Understanding that I do not know revelations. I do not know revelations, okay? But I can read it. And there it says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. All I know about that is the, in the constellation is a Virgo, Virgo, one of the constellations and it was a woman. And it looks just like this in the, in the, uh, if you were to look at the constellation in the sky. And she being with, with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dry, dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. I know nothing about that. Okay. 
and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. A third of the devil of the of the angels that were created in the beginning became the devil spirits and went with Lucifer, a third part of them, and did cast them to earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for devour her child as soon as it was born. And she, she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. I think that's talking about Jesus Christ. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's why I believe that. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. And the throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, about three and a half years. That's what those numbers add up to. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. That great, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's part of the kingdom of this world today. <coughs> the adversary, I call him because he's adverse us, he's adverse God and his son, Jesus Christ. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He is called the God of this world. And he is cast into earth. But when we believe Romans 10, 9, and 10, we get born again. We actually get more than that. We become citizens of heaven. We got, this world is not our home. It's not our home. We need to recognize this in our daily living. This is not our home. They're never going to agree with us. The world is not going to, never. No matter what political party, what you want, this is the adversary's kingdom. But we belong to another kingdom which will have no end. We need to keep that in our minds. There was a war in heaven. You know what? There's still a war in heaven. It is still going on. We don't see everything or know everything that's going on unless God tells us. But we do have the ability to speak in tongues, and it helps the saints that are in the world. Hello, I'm Steve James, and I'm the teacher and author of the podcast called The More Abundant Life. And what we just finished listening to was the first session in a four-part series on the topic of liberty and freedom in Christ Jesus. And each week, I'll be adding another installment of that teaching series. So just sit back and enjoy. The episode is complete. So head over to stevejanes.com for show notes. While there, sign up for our newsletter. Grab the freebies and check out all that Reverend Steve Janes has available. Steve has plenty to give, audio and video teachings, articles, blogs, and biblical study books, all there to help you continue to grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All keys to help you live the life you've always wanted to live.